Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is George A. Silvito. I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from drugs, alcohol, and codependency. I'm also privileged uh, for the last 21 years to be one of the pastors here at Grace Church. Well, tonight, uh, uh, just uh, if you're new to us, let me let you know that this, uh, this ministry is based on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, as well as uh, eight principles that kind of uh, mirror those. So tonight, uh, we're at the beginning of the new year. We're starting in step one. So let's read principle one and step one. Principle one is on the screen. Let's read this. I know you read it a minute ago, but I want to know if you're awake tonight. Ready, go. Realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor, Matthew 5, 3. And then step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is right, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. So tonight, uh, we're going to talk about denial. Say denial. So there's a story that I read this week about a guy who was madly in love with this girl who was only mildly and somewhat interested in him. Uh, to, To find out if she really loved me, he said, I hooked her up to a lie detector, and just as I suspected... My machine was broken. (laughs) What was this guy's problem? Denial, yeah. So one of Charlie Brown's comic strips has Linus and Charlie Brown talking together. And Linus says, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. In fact, that is a distinct philosophy of mine. No problem is so big or complicated that it can't be run away from. What was Linus's problem? Denial. Uh, There's this guy in the Bible whose name is Peter, and he struggled with this compulsion. It was an obsession towards self-importance. And one day he says to Jesus, I'm going to die for you. I would never abandon you. I'm your man. And then Jesus gets in hot water and and, and is, is arrested, and Peter denies knowing Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times, and you know what they say, strike one, strike two, strike three, and you're out. What was Peter's problem? Denial. So I'm a senior in high school when the earth was cooling. In 1978 and 79, I was using drugs and alcohol every day. My best friends were all getting ready for college, And I was getting ready for my next great adventure with my partner in crime, Dennis. My friends were taking the SATs, and I was taking drugs. I was taking it easy. I was taking my parents' money, and I was taking my boss's beer from the cooler. My parents were telling me that I'd better get serious about my future. And I was serious. I was serious about my next high or the next girl or the next party. What was my problem? Denial. Denial. That's right. Does this sound familiar to anybody in the room tonight? <laughs> yeah, am, am I alone tonight? No, we, we, we all know this. And see, tonight we're going to look at a biblical story about a man who was in denial about his compulsive behaviors. He had this propensity, because I can't relate to this at all, he had this propensity to overwork. He was a performance addict. He was a, <laughs> what? He was a perfectionist. And, uh, and, and the truth is, my closest friends in the room know that I can really relate a lot to this guy. He's found in the Old Testament. His name is Moses. Now, Moses had quite a testimony. I mean, he had a spiritual resume. He was born a poor slave, but raised in the palace, in the Pharaoh's palace. And then one day, when he was a little bit older, he killed an Egyptian soldier, tried to cover it up. He had to run away from Egypt, and he lived for 40 years as a renegade. There was a bounty on his head. But then on the backside of a mountain called Sinai, God calls him to lead this revolutionary movement to go back to Egypt and to release over a million Hebrew slaves. Now listen what was on this guy's spiritual resume. God used him to send 10 plagues so that Pharaoh would finally relent and let God's people go. God used Moses to part the Red Sea. God used Moses to hit a rock with a stick and water would come out. 
God used Moses that he would call and pray and manna, bread would fall from heaven and birds from heaven to feed the people. This guy had quite a resume. And then he spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness and he moves from the role of being the great liberator to being the day-to-day manager. And he's overworking. He's got over a million people he's responsible for. And then one day, his pagan father-in-law, Jethro, comes to see him. The scripture's on the screen. Let me read it for you. It's Exodus 18, verses 13 through 16. The next day, Moses took his seat to hear the people's disputes against each other. Now, this is because he's the day-to-day manager. They waited before him from morning till evening. Now, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he asked, what are you really accomplishing here? Why are you trying to do this alone while everyone stands around you from morning till evening? And Moses replied, because people, listen to the denial in this, because people come to me to get a ruling from God. When a dispute arises, they come to me. And I am the one who settles the case between the quarrels. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. Now what Moses didn't know was that his normal wasn't normal. What he didn't know was that this propensity that he had to work from morning to night, day after day after day, wasn't normal. And God sends him, his father-in-law, to point it out. Now, here's what I've discovered about when my normal is abnormal. I can always see other people's abnormal as crazy, but I don't always see it in my own life. You see, over the years, I had parents by the droves come to see me. I've been here 21, almost 21 years now. And I've had parents over the years come to see me about their adolescent and young adult sons going crazy with drugs and all kinds of stuff. I could see that their normal was abnormal perfectly. But the problem was that I was missing it at home with my own son. It's called denial. Moses could not see that his normal wasn't normal. And tonight, you might be just like Moses and just like me. Maybe tonight you cannot see that your normal is whack. Maybe you cannot see that your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups are out of control. So what we're going to try to do is try and look at some of the possible ways in which some of us might respond to our out-of-control hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Are you ready? Uh, Oh, come on now. That was two of us. Are you ready? All right. So let me suggest... Four possible responses to this question. What are some possible responses to my out of control hurts, habits, and hangups? If you need a pen, there should be one there right in front of you, and you can fill in the blanks. So here's the first fill in the blank in your notes. Number one, one possible response to my out of control hurt, habit, and hangup is I am not hurting anyone else. Say that with me. I am not hurting anyone else. I don't know this for sure. But I have to think that this is where Moses was living. He had just become comfortable with this out of control, compulsive behavior to work all the time. And Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was his, what I want to call tonight, denial buster. He was the one who was going to tell him the truth. Now, my hunch is, if you're honest with yourself and you look over your history, whatever it might be, whatever your compulsive behaviors are, there is probably a Jethro in your life. Somebody who God brought into your life to be a denial buster, a truth teller, somebody to point their finger at you and say, your normal isn't normal. For me, there was a guy named Jeff Watts. When I was in my uh, third year of my freshman year college, you know, and um, some of you will get that on the way home. And uh, I was newly married to Cheryl. I married her just a few days after she graduated from high school. And we're newly married and we're in college and I'm still running back to the dormitory like I'm a young single stud and I'm married now. And Jeff Watts comes to me one day and he says, I will no longer be spending time with you because you need to go act like a married man. Or my father-in-law, my gentle father-in-law who is almost Amish, he's so kind and gentle. My gentle father-in-law who told me just a few days after our first son was born, 
that I was being a very bad husband and I wasn't doing very well in my two-day adventure as a father either. Or I think about Dennis's, my drugging and drinking buddy in high school. I think about his mother, who was one of the most mean-spirited Christians I'd ever met. But about how one night after I had accepted Jesus but was still out drinking every day, one night Dennis and I were at a party and he dropped me off at my house and drove around the corner and wrapped his car around a palm tree. Dennis survived. Where I was sitting, I would have been cut in half. And I went to Dennis's mother's house to check on Dennis. And God used this denial buster, this truth teller, to point her bony finger in my chest and say, God saved you for a purpose. And I'm your pastor today because of that mean-spirited Christian woman. Now, God will always have somebody in your life if you're honest, who's telling you that your normal isn't normal. If you're living in this denial that I'm not hurting anyone else, well, then you have good company because Moses was there too. Moses' denial buster was just father and all. Look at what he says, verse 17. Let's read this together. Ready? Good. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Underline the phrase, you're going to wear yourself out and the people too. You see, Moses thought that he was only wearing himself out. But the Bible says crystal clearly here that he was wearing out the people too. You see, Moses' obsession with working was hurting others. When I was using every day, I was clueless to how my reckless living was impacting the people who loved me most and the people that I loved. And as I was working on this talk this week for for tonight, I started to think about the many, many nights in which I would walk in, drunk, stoned, half out of my mind, and see my mother sitting in the dark. Now, I can see it now crystal clearly. But back in those days, if you asked me, I would have told you straight up, I'm not hurting anybody. I can do whatever I want. Some of you are there tonight. And I want you to know that I'm not hurting anyone else is a lie from the pit of hell. I see the pain every day when people with out of control hurts, habits, and hangups. I see the pain they cause their parents and friends of alcoholics and addicts and codependents and the rest caused by by loved ones who, who step into my office. It's devastating. This week, I spent over an hour with a woman telling me the pain that she's enduring because of an adult son who's out of control in his addictions and all his accompanying behavior. Do not believe the lie that what you're doing isn't hurting anybody else. How many spouses sob over the brokenness of their partners? How many parents agonize over the addictions of their children? How many roommates weep over the out-of-control obsessions of their friends? You see, our out-of-control hurts, habits, and hang-ups, they don't just affect us. They affect others, and they affect them badly. So that's one possible response, but it's not a good one. Here's a second response, second fill in the blank. I don't have a problem. Yeah, how many of us have said that one? Yeah. The rest of you are lying. You, you, okay. Say that with me. I don't have a problem. Say it like you mean it. I don't have a problem. You see, this to me seems to be the most common response to out of control, out of control hurts, habits, and hangups. I know that in, in my own recovery, for example, from one of my character defects, which is anger, uh, my wife Cheryl has been one of my greatest gifts of truth-telling and denial-busting in my life. We just celebrated uh, a few months ago that we've been married for 35 years. And over the last uh, 12 to 13 years, um, we have journeyed with my son, Nathan, through his addiction. And it has brought out in me um, some blood-curdling, venomous anger, uh, screaming and cursing that you would not expect of a Christian, much less a pastor even threats of physical violence against my son. And it is spilled out onto my wife, Cheryl. And a defining moment came for us. I've told you about this before. When we were coming home from a vacation in North Carolina, 
And Nathan had messed up again. We'd heard the news by, by phone, and, and I threw an anger fit right there in the car. And then Cheryl said this, do you know what your problem is, George? Now, I knew that this was really going to hurt. <laughs> and here's what my denial buster truth-telling wife said. You care more about what Nathan does and how it affects you than what Nathan does and how it affects him. Ouch. You see, until that moment, I was living in the land of denial about my anger and how, yeah, my son's circumstances might have brought it out me and I wanted to point to him, but the issue was really about me. Who, me? I don't have a problem. It's Nathan who's got the problem. He's the addict. Cheryl's got the problem. She's the codependent. If she would just be stronger. Me, I'm together. Right. So I love the rawness of the Bible. If you're afraid of the Bible, don't be, because it shoots straight. It tells all the ugly parts of the story. Uh, every year, at least once a year when I'm teaching, I, I, I go to this proverb that, that talks about how, how to help out-of-control alcoholic see that they really indeed do have a problem. Let me read it for you again. It's Proverbs 23, 29 through 35. Who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? Who's always complaining? This looks like my resume, right? <laughs> who has unnecessary bruises? Who has a bloodshot eyes? It's the one who spends long hours in the taverns, trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, see how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it, bite, it bites like a poisonous snake. <laughs> It stings like a viper. Can somebody say yes? Yeah. You will see hallucinations. Come on. This is in the Bible. And you will say crazy things. I remember one night I thought I was Spider-Man, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> you will stagger. Listen to this. Huh? For those of us that recover from alcoholism, come on now. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mast. And you will say, now this is the best line, read this with me. They hit me, but I didn't feel it. I didn't even know it when they beat me up. When will I awake so I can look for another drink? Come on, church. It's right in the Bible. See, that's how abnormal our normal can get for the alcoholic, for the addict, for the codependent. Let's not just beat up the addicts and the alcoholics for the angry person, for the workaholic, or whatever else your hurt habit or hang it, habit is. So let me just tell you the truth. I don't have a problem is another lie from the pit of hell. Here's a third possible response. I can do this alone. <laughs> Say that with me. I can do this alone. See, if, if this is where you're living tonight, if you're saying, you know, I'm going to come to celebrate recovery on Friday nights, and, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to like go too deep in this recovery. I got two words for you. Good luck. <laughs> Three Dog Night wrote a song in 1969 that said, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. The, the creation story screams that it's not good for us to be alone. God made us as human beings. He made the first set of human beings in a pair. Even when you think about the mystery of our faith, if you're all new to this whole Christianity thing, we have this whack idea, but we believe it, that God is mysteriously and perfectly living in community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even the Lego movie says it best. Everyone, everything is awesome. Everything is awesome when you're part of a team. I learned that from my grandson. <laughs> you see, I can do this alone is equally from the pit of hell. It's just not smart. Listen to Proverbs 12, 15. Read this with me. Ready? Go. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. You see, it's foolish to deal with our hurts and our habits and our hang-ups by ourselves. Let me remind you again that all of us, say all of us, all of us are blinded by our normal. We need fresh eyes and a new perspective. We need denial busters and truth tellers in our life. 
I've read many years ago the 12 and 12 of AA, but I picked it up this week, the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, and I found this quote, few indeed were those so assailed had ever won through single, ever won through in single-handed combat. It, is, it was a statistical fact that alcoholics almost, what's the next word there? Yeah. Never recover on their own resources. Can I tell you that one of the dangers of Celebrate Recovery is that you can come, you can sit in these large groups, the band's hot, you love to sing the songs, you can listen to the lessons and be encouraged. You can listen to the testimonies and cry. You can come down here and kneel at this altar, and you never step into a small group or join a step study. You taste recovery, but you never chew on it. In the church of Jesus, listen to me, and I'm going to say this twice. It's this important. In the church of Jesus, the miracles almost always happen not in rows, but in circles. Let me say that again. In the church of Jesus, the miracles almost always happen not in rows, but in circles. So are you trying to manage your out-of-control hurts, habits, and hang-ups alone? It's a lie. Here's the only truth. Number four, I'm done. Say that with me. I am done. Say it like you mean it. I am done. See, this is the place and this is the space in your life when you get there and you say, I'm done. When you say, uncle, where you admit that you cannot fix your life. When you say, uncle, when you're tired of wandering and wondering in the land of denial. Go back with me to the Moses story. Moses has his truth teller, his denial buster, his father-in-law, call out his abnormal normal, tells him that it's not normal, tells him that it's killing Moses and it's killing the people. And listen to what it says in Exodus 18, 24. Moses listened to his father-in-law's advice and followed his suggestions. He left the land of denial. Interesting that we have this whole saying around here that denial is not a river in Egypt, you know. And Moses literally left Egypt. See, Moses was listening to his denial buster. He was saying, I'm done. You know what Moses did in that moment in verse 24? He did his first step. He picked up his white chip. He got his desire chip. He desired to live a new kind of life. He became sick and tired of his abnormal normal. So read step one with me one more time. It's on the screen. We admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. It could be that you are in this very place tonight because you needed to hear this. And here's the promise of God I want to give to you. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. Read this last line with me. Ready, go. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. You see, God wants to rescue you. Listen to me. Don't believe the lie of the evil one. God wants to rescue you from every trap, and he wants to heal you from every disease. And to this point, you could say, yeah, that sounds good for the seminary-trained preacher. But I want to invite my friend Patty to come on up here. Patty, come on up here. Where are you at, Patty? Patty, Patty, make your way up here. I'm going to invite Patty Hoffman. And this week when I was getting ready, here, Patty. This week when I was getting ready for the message. Hi, everybody. Hey, turn Patty's mic on. Said, turn my mic on. There you go. So I, Hi, I, I, I read something she put on Facebook. And Patty, um, how many years ago did you walk in here? Over nine years Over ago. Over nine years ago. Yes. And uh, just in general, what shape were you in nine years ago? <laughs> I remember, but what shape were you in? Um, I was in really bad shape. Um, I was, just came off the streets from heavy alcohol, heavy drug addiction, crack addiction, cocaine. Yeah. I came in on my knees. Came in on your knees. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you, came on, you came on a Friday night, I think, was your first night here, was it? Yeah. yeah, and I and, threatened people. And you threatened people. I yeah. remember you. Mary told me about that one. So, um, and and um, uh, how soon after that did this idea of Jesus being your healer, 
who could rescue you and deliver you from all of this, from the traps and the diseases of your life? How long after you came the first time did it make sense? Was it that first night? It, it took a little while. It took a little while? It took a little while. But so you I kept knew. having to come back, right? I kept coming back. Hello. I had to come hey, back. kept coming back, yeah. Because I, you know, I threaten people that if they call a pastor over to pray over me, I'm going to knock them out. Knock them know? out, yeah. That was really tough. Yeah, yeah. You, know? you yeah, you, you still had yeah. street in you. you were, I did. <laughs> okay. Very. Okay. And so it, then it started making sense, kind of like a dimmer switch. It started yeah. to come on for you. And then what were some of the things that you've done over the last you know, eight or nine years that, like, that you're here standing here today? Everything different. Everything? Everything different. Every One at a time. Because yeah. I noticed that when I first got in, and uh, in the step work, you put things on paper, you know? And it was funny that you said that, because uh, my sponsor pointed out that I was a thief. I didn't know I was a thief. And she <laughs> said, well, you, you got this guy's car, and you never brought it back that you're a thief. And I said, well, I brought it back two days later. <laughs> but I guess I'm a thief. So I learned a lot in that step work. Yeah. But, um... And so, so, so you, you step work sponsorship, kept going to meetings. Kept going to meetings. Kept doing the next right thing. Yes. So, uh, so this week, you, you, you wrote something on your Facebook about a resume. Would you, would you tell oh, them what you, what you wrote about in your resume? I you were going to post it up there. Well, no, no, no. I'm going to yeah. let you. They'd rather hear it from you. Yeah. T tell them a little bit about what you posted on, your, on uh, Facebook this week about well, your resume. Well, one of the things when I first got into recovery and you go and fill out a job application, that was very intimidating to me because, you know, they say the last three jobs. So, you know, this one job, I think it was like three weeks long, and then there's like a two or three year gap in between. So you can't tell the employer, well, I was smoking crack in Pine Manor, you know, <laughs> it couldn't work. Yeah. So um, it was really nerve wracking when I first got in, but over the years, I just updated my resume, and I could go back nine years, and I know exactly where I've been Come on. for the last nine years. Yeah, you yeah. Know? It's like, wow. <laughs> so, in, indeed, God gave you a new resume. Amen. And a new resume. So Amen. what would you say to the person who's here tonight or watching online? What would you say to the person who's here tonight, Patty, who is where you were that first time, I think it was Mary that drug you in here. Was it Mary? Mary did. Thank yeah. you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Sorry, I Thank you. We love you. you, Mary. We love you, Mary. <laughs> and and Mary's committed the rest of her life and the best of her life to drag more Patties in here. So so, so and so and she, now she got Patty with her, her second lieutenant. And so, uh, what would you tell the person that that? Because I remember when you gave your testimony, you said, he's like, oh, what are all these crazy people? And yeah. I remember when you told that, when you told your testimony, I was sitting up here uh, the first time I heard you give your testimony. I kept thinking, like it was better in Pine Manor. You know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, but she, but uh, so what would you tell the person who's where you were nine years ago? Because somebody here just, is where you were nine years ago. Just keep coming back, even when it gets tough. Because in the beginning, I was scared to death. Yeah. You know, and I had to keep talking to people. And the minute I felt angry or scared, the easy thing to do is to run back where you've been. But the hard thing to do is straighten out. Yeah. You know, so just keep coming back. And show, when it's in, in the back, show them the, the next slide. And one, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go, go back to the back slide, the next the slide before and that. And I think the devil is a liar because when I had it all on paper, it, what it seemed like on paper, I'll never get my license because I had thousands in tickets. Mm. And I'll never get a good job. And I'll never, that's the devil wanting me to go back in Pine Manor. That's right. You know? Come on. So the more, the next day, one day at a time that I stayed sober, I was able to update my resume a little more. Yeah. You know? So keep doing the next right thing. Keep doing the so next right thing. So look at the scripture. Thing. Look at the scripture there. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him, for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. God wants to do that for you. All right, let's stand for prayer. Hey, thank Patty. Thank Patty. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. So let's, uh, let's pray. Let's pray. So God... Um, There's some precious person who's here tonight. Somebody who doesn't believe that, that they matter. There's some young man here who, who thinks that his past defines his present and his future. There's some young woman here who believes that 
that the wreckage of out of control hurts, habits, and hangups could never be dealt with. But we thank you that that's a lie. We thank you that Jesus is our higher power. And that he wants to help us to, to not live into the lie that we're not hurting anybody else. He wants us to believe the lie that we don't need anybody else. That we don't really even have a problem. But I pray God that that precious man, that precious woman tonight would get to the place where they would simply say, I'm done. I'm done. We thank you for Patty's story. We thank you for the amazing, almost now decade of life transformation that you've done in her life and her daughter of face life. And we thank you, Lord, that if you've done it in any time, you can do it now. If you've done it in any place, you can do it here. If you've done it in any one, you can do it for anybody. Thank you, God, that you're here tonight and that you want to give hope to folk who feel hopeless. I pray for that person that here tonight thinks they need you the least and the one who's here tonight knows that they need you the most. Pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody green said, amen. So what we do if you're new is uh, we're going to sing another song and the altar is going to be open. And it's just wood and steel and carpet and a pillar. But it's a kind of a place, a symbol of kind of kneeling and saying, God, I need you. If you need somebody to pray with you, just lift a hand and one of our team will be glad to pr pray with you. Worship team's going to lead us in a song. So the altar's open.